This video is brought to you by Slate Black Industries. For grips and accessories, visit slateblackindustries.com. I'm on you. Stand by. Impact! Neutralize! 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 Impact! I see it. Low, right. Neutralize! Impact! Low. That was a neutralize, yes. right? Short. That's it. All right. a struggle uh, I think at 500 I started having a little bit of struggles that was a little bit me so these are 700 yard impacts for 77 grains so those are the Mach 12s yeah pretty uh, insignificant when you see it actually on the steel compared to you know up close you get a nice full splash yeah So this was an interesting run. We'll guys see. We'll see you guys at the debrief, and maybe we'll run the uh, other uh, attacker equipped Mark 12 that Josh has, just to see what type of difference we'll see with a change of technology. See you guys at the debrief. Welcome into the debrief for this run. On the Speedway runs, we break down our evaluations based on segmented categories. So we'll talk about the overall run and the shooter's performance, hitting on how the base firearm, the sighting system, the cartridge, and the environmentals all came into play during the course of the run. Now, unlike our regular practical accuracy series, the Speedway course challenges the shooter to shoot as fast as possible while also accounting for constantly changing elevation and wind holds as needed. This presents a unique challenge that the shooter then has to overcome. So let's get into it. All right, I'd start by saying our expectations for this particular rifle were high, as in very high, as in probably too high. What would you say? Uh, it's a rifle that I'm imminently familiar with. Uh, I've shot for a long time. And so I agree. I think our expectations were too high. But that's not to say that the rifle is not capable. Well, and where I go with this is your initial response to the run being completed was, man, that was a struggle. And looking back on the run, I actually really don't think it was a struggle. I mean, you had... A couple misses at 500 and 650 that you self-corrected for, collected the hits. And then on the bonus target, yeah, like there were some misses. You probably could have hit that faster. 
But at the end of the day, you really didn't add any time to your overall score because the you actually got the hit eventually and subtracts the time off. So was it the best run? No. But, and this is what the important part of this is, is I do think that it was a repeatable run. And we know that it was a repeatable run because, to be honest, we tried it a few times uh, since we were thinking that, well, this wasn't probably the best representation of the rifle, but the results across were just about identical. Impact! Neutralize! Impact! Neutralize! Impact! Neutralize! Impact! Neutralize! Impact! Neutralize! Impact! I see it. Neutralize! Uh, 450? Yep. Impact! Neutralize! Impact! Neutralize! Impact! Neutralize! Bonus! Bonus! Impact! Woo! What's the time? Nothing. We no, won't find out until we go in a post. <laughs> so there were different parts in each of those runs that we would struggle on. It's either the close range or the long range. Sometimes I would do, I would take my time a little bit too much up close, and then out far, I would collect it back. Um, and sometimes I would push through extremely fast up close. And then out far, I was still pushing way too fast. Mm -hmm. And I had to reel myself back in a little a little bit, which is, I think, the one that we finally used for record, which is like a second or two uh, difference. Right. So, again, repeatable. And that, that's an important piece of this. Is the rifle in and of itself capable of going one for one at extreme speed all the way out from a raw technical perspective? Probably. It probably can do it. It's a one to one and a half inch gun in its configuration and 10 power shooting 77s probably could. But again, part of what we're doing here is trying to balance that speed alongside the, pre the precision elements. You were pushing the speed. Uh, obviously, the advanced... Well, hello there. You must have caught me freshening up the 9-hole reviews Mark 12. Now, did you know the 9-hole reviews is largely supported by Slate Black Industries and the patrons of Patreon? That's true. All those 77 OTMs, all those heartbreaks and range fees that we experience. Behind us, we have the patrons of Patreon who support us not only financially and intellectually, but emotionally. So today I'd like to invite you to become one of us. Join us on Patreon and become a patron of Patreon. And if not, completely understand. We'd be just as happy to hear from you in the comments section down below. But for now, onwards we go you were pushing the speed. Uh, obviously the advantage of this system, a rifle length gas system uh, on an 18 inch barrel uh, is going to be the soft recoil impulse and your ability to fire very quickly. So how does that come into effect on a speed-based course? 
because the odds of collecting the hit versus what happens if you don't, your ability to make a quick, fast correction because you're probably on target through the entire firing sequence probably affords you the capability of being a little bit faster on the trigger, even if it means you're not perfectly set up for every single shot. So in your mind, did you think you were taking like really perfect sight pictures on every single shot or were you flexing that speed a little bit uh, knowing that you could get your correction and then take follow-up shots quickly based on the setup. I was massively flexing the speed. Um, initially, the first the first ever run for Speedway, I think it was with the Mark 12, and I took my time way too much, and I used a 20-round mag initially. I kind of thought, to myself why am i limiting myself to a 20 round magazine yeah you clone <laughs> clone correct boy over here huh I, well the the good thing to, to 20 round mags is that it gives you your prone unlimited <laughs> right, right, elevation right, 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 right. dip and then i i just I, yeah i just grabbed one of the 30 round gi mags and, and slapped it in honestly off of the bag you don't bottom it out like you would on a bipod right, right. so i had 30 rounds to go that gives me like a good 10 plus rounds that I could potentially miss. I mean, obviously, it's not good to miss 10 plus rounds. I mean, that's not a good strategy to just like continually miss and and modify your firing solution to get on target. It's a strategy that's not a good strategy, obviously. <laughs> mm-hmm. But yes, I mean, of course, that gives you a little bit more. The low recoil, being able to spot your own hits... Uh, being able to get back on target very quickly um all of that yeah it, it, and and having a higher mag capacity to where you don't risk running into a reload as quickly mm-hmm. all of that contributes to getting to basically play it a little faster and looser mm-hmm. when it comes to the speedway all right um, so with that said the decision to play it faster and looser, yeah. I mean, you you were pretty darn good, and you were able to get everything sort of sorted out, even through the 650. I'd say even if you had a couple misses, you were able to correct on them. But shooting faster, shooting more rounds, shorter period of time, gets things hotter than they otherwise would. And so that's an interesting segue that I want to get into. Uh, one of your immediate takeaways after the Mark 12 run was, wow, I was seeing way more Mirage than I thought I was going to, especially near the end of the run, which is, of course, where the targets are harder and harder to hit. (laughs) So you're getting uh, the introduction of the Mirage coming off the AEM-5. I've never seen Mirage that bad. Talk us through how that impacted your ability to make effective shots on those further targets. It was more difficult. I mean, bottom line, if you're shooting at a target and it looks like you're you're on a boat, but you're not actually on a boat because your platform is not moving with you. It's just the air that's traveling up from your suppressor that's making it move. It really looks like your crosshairs in the target are moving all over the place. I mean, that's a fair assessment, right, Henry? It basically looks like the target is moving around and flickering into different segments of your crosshairs, or your crosshairs themselves are moving within mm-hmm. relation to the target. That gives you a massive margin of error. So at that point, it's sort of like it's like, sort of like when we're shooting Kalashnikovs on practical accuracy and figuring out the cone of fire, right? Um, trying to fight through it is the best way I can describe now, I mean, yes, that's a direct causality from pushing it really fast with a highly effective suppressor, but a suppressor that retains a lot of heat. Um, and honestly, that's something that I did not experience as much previously because I haven't pushed the system this way as much. And so I think while suppressors in the tactical sense and a military sense gives you a definitive uh advantage on the offensive role if let's say let's say if we were to apply this to a military setting this would probably be a very defensive role that you're taking agreed 
in you know in in taking multiple shots at a, in a target rich environment you would probably want to consider taking the suppressor off if you are already in a defensive position and your location is relatively known to enemy forces um i did not get a suppressor wrap for it because it is not clone boy looking so but still even with a suppressor wrap i mean that would that would buy you like what 15, you might get yeah you might get another half a mag or mag out of it yeah so that's that would be my right. estimation i mean i've seen i've seen mirage in the desert before that's that's not that's not a thing that's not a big deal i've seen mirage off of uh, precision rifles sniper rifles when you cook the barrel a little more but this was severe like parts of the mirage actually blurred the entire image and mm -hmm. i couldn't really i could only see colors so I, maybe we could roll the the video of when i shot really fast but oh, then yeah. you were just so cooking fast. yeah yeah impact neutralized 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 i see it and i i simply i could not see the 500 yard target at that point um, and so Josh just told me stop, 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 okay. and it's it's because he knew he. I think you saw you saw what the. <laughs> I didn't realize what the barrel looked like. I didn't. I just you, when you told me to stop, I got off the rifle and I was like, oh, <laughs> this thing is pouring smoke. That's enough. Yep. Well, I could see that what was happening was it was ineffective, right? At that point, you were ineffective and it was not worth continuing. Um, and we assessed thereafter that it was definitely a, a Mirage-based issue. I did have trouble seeing from the Mirage. I actually, I've never seen Mirage that bad. A good rifle will generally perform about the same with or without the suppressor attached. In the case of this Mark 12 and my Mark 12 as well, we know that the addition of the AEM-5 actually tightens the group size, and we've proved that across numerous types of ammunition and numerous rifles. So with that said, in hindsight, looking back, what you're telling me is you would probably, for the purposes of this specific setup on Speedway, you would probably remove the suppressor uh, mm -hmm. to game the course as effectively as possible, in spite of the fact that you might lose a half an inch or a quarter of an inch, quarter to a half an inch on the well, accuracy in terms of the group size loosening up. In this application, yes, I think shooting it, even though you get a, a slight penalty and get a looser grouping, uh, the, the, heat, the better heat dissipation is something that I absolutely would choose over it's being suppressed. And that's probably a product because most of the time, most people are never shooting at this at this cadence with the level of accuracy we're attempting to secure, yourself included, as you mm -hmm. say. So yeah. um, it is an interesting exercise to push suppress rifles like that to see, you know, to get this type of data. Because it's not unique to this particular suppressor either. You know, we do that with any of the cans, it's gonna happen. Um, mm -hmm. I want to talk to you about the strategy you took on the run, which was to not dial at all throughout the duration until I think it was the last target. Mm -hmm. Now, the traditional mill dot is set up for ranging. It's not set up as a ballistic reference uh, dot. I mean, can it be used for that? Of course, yes. Uh, but it's it's set up for snipers to figure out the, the ranging distance and then for them to dial in the firing solution. So using it as a ballistic drop uh, is not its primary function, of course. Right. Uh, but, of course, it can be used that way, and it is a lot faster than dialing every single target. We do have rifles that we have to do that, that, that do not have any type of ballistic reference on the reticle. 
Uh, and you could tell when you watch those videos that it is actually slower because every single time after target X, you come up, you have to figure out your firing solution, continue on, and then hold over or hold under. This was not the case. Um, now, that said, it's still not a modern reticle. We've had a lot of reticle design changes since then. Initially, it was the Horus and then a little more uh, progressing towards where we are now. You had the ACSS and then I feel like ever since then, it, the reticle designs kind of just exploded into a myriad of X companies ballistic reticle with a grid underneath to do holdovers. And so I think that's an acknowledgement that holdovers are indeed effective and fast. Now I decided to do holdovers, however, purely based off of speed, um, especially when you're talking about your closer engagement targets and specifically talking about the 100 to 400 meter targets or so. Uh, you can do holdovers and be a lot less affected by wind. Uh, you still have a lot of velocity out of the 556, 77 grain. And so just holding off to the target left or the target right is no big deal. Um, Using this sort of the center bar of the reticle along with the mill dots themselves as your reference right. points in that vertical plane, correct? Correct, yes. So uh, using holdovers was specifically done for speed. Now, once I passed, once I went through the entire rack of mill dots and I went to the very end and, and the 650 target, I was using the top or the bottom of the reticle where it starts turning into the thicker stadii. That was easy to reference. Obviously, it looks different. That's at like around the five-ish mils uh, hold. So I was holding that as kind of like a hat on top of the round gong out there and, you know, shot that. But then past that, there's no reference. So you had to, I had to dial for the, uh, for the, uh, uh, the long shot. Now, the other, re the other advantage you get to dialing, especially with that 700 yard shot, 720 yard shot, um, that shot's going to be a little bit more affected by wind. So if you're talking about giving it a good firing solution, taking the elevation estimation out and just being able to use your horizontal mill grid to uh, push wind, if you do have anything, if, if you do then spot splash and no impact, you're able to then adjust your horizontal impacts directly onto the uh, the uh, correcting the the firing solution and collecting that impact. Okay, so a slight interjection here. There is a method called dialing negatives. Uh, if you're dialing a negative zero onto your scope, you could better use your elevation side of the mill dot scope for seven or eight mils worth of drop. Uh, which would cover the 720 yard uh, type of distance with a uh, Mark 12. This is not a Mark 12, it's an M24. But uh, you run into a few issues. So rifle scopes from this era, like this M24, are not mill graduated turrets. So a lot of them are MOA. This one runs a pretty coarse MOA. Same thing with a Mark 12. So it would be difficult to figure out where your negative two mils are uh, to draw a good zero. On top of that, um, these turrets really, they're designed for you to zip your distance quickly. Let's say this M24 turret and the Mark 12 turret, they both have your yardage or meter range already put into the turret. Uh, so you don't look at how many MOA you're dialing up on, but rather you're looking at the distance that's etched onto the turret itself. And you use your mill dots for range, uh, for ranging for the target, figuring out the range of the target. But the other thing too, when you're talking about using a fairly limited mill dot reticle, even if you dial it to where you have seven or eight mils of elevation drop. You're talking about shooting a lighter cartridge out of the Mark 12, 77 grains, which are less susceptible to wind than 55 grains or 62 grain ball ammunition, but still more susceptible to wind than let's say your um, M118LR uh, or your uh, 300 wind mags or especially 338 Lapua. So 
as it goes down that grid, it is going to still become harder and harder to adjust on the windage side on how far you want to hold off if you're just looking at the open field with no uh, grid reticle, uh, which is, again, why I opted to dial to the uh, 720 range and then use my horizontal grid to figure it out. Anyways, back to the show. Okay, so all of that was very optic and reticle centric conversation. The last thing I really want to wrap this up with uh, is a conversation about um, the projectiles that we used. Um, the 77 OTMs, walk us through the choice of the 77s. Obviously, it's my favorite ammunition for shooting at distance. Talk us through why we, why we opt to go with those. I mean, so first of all, I mean, it's this, the 77s are no uh, stranger to optimizing a 5.56 rifle with a 1.7 twist barrel to shoot at a greater distance. And a part of that isn't just because of bullet drop, but uh, better wind deflection as opposed to 55 or 62 grain uh, ball ammunition, especially M855, because the non-concentric core does make the M855 fly a little worse than the um, M193s. Now, the 77 specifically, even though as much as you optimize it, it is still a 5.56. You're giving it a much longer boat tail projectile, and so it is going to for perform better against wind, but it is still a 5.56. I mean, that's something you cannot change. Um, compared to a 5.56, it is going to be as optimized as you can get for this type of course. But uh, I mean, that's that's it. You know, this is that's the best case scenario in shooting this course as far as factory and uh, non-purchased ammunition or a non-hand-loaded ammunition, I'd say. Right. Not necessarily the tightest possible paper groups obviously we know some of the viewers like to shoot 69 some like to shoot 75s and those are great match loads as well even some of the lighter match loads work uh, but when we're talking about their ability to defeat the wind and push out at the distances that we're trying to shoot out to over 700 you know these are the ones we've had the most success with and so speaking of that last element henry the environmentals and the wind uh, obviously, you've already talked through the use of the optic and the lack of wind holdoffs in this period correct optic, uh, a clone correct optic. Do you recall what you were holding out at those further distances on the day? I appreciate it's been a week or so since you shot no, I, it. I remember. I, 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 ex I remember exactly. I was holding about one mil off to the right. Yeah. Uh, so... Um, I was so, holding off one mil off, right. but the problem is one mil on your mill grid, while it may not be an issue when you're holding off, you're holding like a one, two, or even three mils on elevation, you start going lower. And then without a grid, that's a lot of, that's a lot of mind process. So it slows you down in trying to figure out where you're holding. And it's still not very precise. If you miss, you don't exactly know how far you're missing off on because you don't have any type of a grid system. That's when dialing in turns into an advantage because then if you were to dial in, you still have your horizontal mill bar to figure out uh, where you're holding. So I think there were actually a few shots at, you know, at distance when I was trying to uh, observe where the uh, misses were that I had trouble basically trying to correlate where the top one mil dot is and how far I can hold off. Especially when we then introduce the concept or the issue of dealing with Mirage as well. So again, all of this comes back to a conversation about the challenges that we're trying to induce on this course. We're pushing accuracy, speed, the constant changing of elevation calls and wind calls as you move out on the course. And, uh, you know, ultimately, this is what this course is designed to do to provide uh, data back there from. One thing, though, as we as we sign off, I want to harken back to the initial idea, initial feeling of, wow, that was a struggle going out. That's exactly why I said that is because I was struggling to correlate the mill holds and the wind holds and correlate it to how far I have to push it. And I said it was a struggle on top of that with the non-suppressed rifles. We typically know how 
we did on time. With a, not, with a suppressed rifle, the timer's not getting anything. So I have no idea how well or how poorly I did. In my mind, space-time continuum goes a lot slower <laughs> when you have to make a lot of those adjustments on the fly. And in my mind, I was just thinking, I really screwed that one up. I, I, all I remembered were the misses. And yes trying to struggle to to get that windage on correctly without dialing so yeah well look with that said i think that's a great place to wrap this particular conversation up perhaps in the future we might have an opportunity to shoot a similar platform and provide some of the advantages of some modern technology and use some of the details and data that we've learned from this run to execute even better. What do you say? A better scope, a lack of suppressor, and perhaps shooting with better traverse. That sounds good. You guys, till next time, we'll see you on the range. So if that is as fast bonus. as any race gun or game gun or... 716 is Joe Knight 6, 4 Vic, 8 packs, Red Con 1, Green to Green, top copy, over. Joe Knight 6, this is 716, Roger, over. 716, Joe Knight 1, 1 pack, Green to Green, over. This is 716, Roger, over. I think 2, 1 Victor, 2 packs, Red Con 1.